Do you have a favorite teacher? You know, teachers are my heroes. I, I, I think teachers uh, are some of the greatest human beings on the face of the planet. And I'm not just saying that because we've got a bunch of teachers in here, although we do, which you guys are great and fantastic. But I love teachers. Teachers, they, someone once said, you know, parents bring them in the world and then teachers teach them how to live in the world. I, th I think that's just so wise. In 1800, there was a, a guy by the name of William McGuffey who, who was born in a town called West Findlay, Pennsylvania. And he, as a child, William was head and shoulders amongst the rest of the students in his class. He was, he was so brilliant, so intelligent, he would often outpace the other students. And you remember about that time, it was, it was, it was the time of one-room classes, right? One school. Well, he so far outpaced all the other students in his class. At the age of 14, he actually became a teacher himself. And so he began to teach in those little country schoolhouses in Ohio and Kentucky, about the age of about 20, he realized that there was no standard method to teach students how to read. There wasn't any one particular model that everybody said, this is why we need to do it. So as he moved from school to school, everybody was using a different method and nothing was standardized. In 1826, McGuffey actually became uh, a professor of languages at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. And in 1835, he had a friend, and you may have heard of this friend before, his friend was Harriet Beecher Stowe, and she asked him to write a series of readers for school children. You know, readers, the little bitty books that kind of teach you how to read, starts very, very basic, and then as you move along through your schooling, the readers become a little bit more complex, a little bit more difficult. And these readers that he wrote were called eclectic readers. They actually became the model text for textbooks that we use even today. They follow this steady progression. They begin by teaching principles of the alphabet and phonetics, and then it moves along into simple sentences, and it progresses all the way up to poems and stories. You see vocabulary for McGuffey. He began to teach vocabulary in the context of, of using it in sentences rather than just a list of words. And, or questions. He encouraged students to interact with what they read, which was revolutionary. And so all of, his, all of his teaching was lively. His presentations were crisp, right on point. The basic elements of his teaching model are, are still widely used today. Many of us have benefited from McGuffey's teaching model. And that's what great teachers do, isn't it? They encourage, they inspire, they instruct. But of course, the greatest teacher in the world was Jesus. And He had His own method of teaching. Because whenever it comes to communicating the truths of the kingdom of God, Jesus had His work cut out for Him. You have to understand the people, or the clientele that He was spending His time with. As He traveled through the Judean countryside, he was teaching largely uneducated people. And he was teaching them complicated and abstract truths considering the things of God. That's why he would often teach by using parables. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to look at a few of the key parables that Jesus taught. He would use the parables to take the, the complex, tell a story, and then clarify and make the complex simple. You see, a parable is just that. It's a simple story about to illustrate a deeper, valuable lesson. And Jesus was the master of it. You know, parable, that word actually means to bring side by side. So as He's teaching this complex idea, He's bringing it side by side, something that would have been familiar to them to illustrate and to teach the lesson. So Jesus had this wisdom to simplify the profound spiritual truths He needed to share with humanity. And He would do that in the form of a retellable story. So that once I heard it, I could then pass it along to someone else. 
You know, these basic stories are easy to understand, they're easy to remember, and they're easy to pass on. You'll also notice that many of his parables were of an agricultural nature. That's what the people understood. Almost everybody was involved in agriculture. And so as he talks about a plant growing, they could connect with that. They understood that. They understood things like weather. They understood the basic necessities of life. And that's why a lot of Jesus' parables make up a, a crucial part of the Bible. So before we get into this, we're going to be looking this morning at Matthew chapter 5. Right at the end, we're going to read a parable that Jesus tells right at the end of the Beatitudes. Now the particular story that we're reading, there's a lot of discussion, a lot of debate whether or not it's actually a parable or not. I think it is. I'm going to qualify it as one this morning, just simply because I think that the lesson that it teaches us is just so great. Now, I need you to understand something before we read, all right? So I'm, I'm going to lay some groundwork. I'm going, to, I'm going to take my dozer and flatten the ground so that we can build upon this. You know, as, as followers of Jesus, today, we live in the midst of a world that can be characterized by two things. Moral corruption, spiritual darkness. And it's getting worse every year. The world is a dark and corrupt place. It's essential that you understand that when we talk about what, we're, what we'll read this morning. This Jesus parable has so much to do with the moral corruption of our world and the spiritual darkness. And, and we need to be cognizant of that as believers. The fact that we live in a morally corrupt world and spiritually dark culture. And here's the reason why. If you forget that, if you ever forget that this world is marked by sin and depravity, you will become disillusioned, bitter, and angry. As you watch the television and you see all the junk that goes on on TV, whether you're watching CNN, Fox News, whatever it is, reading the newspaper, as you see those things, if you don't remember that this is a morally corrupt and spiritually dark world, you're going to become disillusioned real quick. You see, as I see these things happening on the television, I remind myself constantly, it's all about sin. This is a sinful place. We live in a sinful world. We live among sinful people. That's how you explain all of these things. School shootings, sin. The quarantine, the COVID, sin. We live in a broken world. And if you don't remember that as a believer, you will become disillusioned. You'll become jaded at life. But the good news that Jesus came and solved all of this. So don't forget this world is marked by sin and depravity. And that's the reason for Jesus' first parable. It's out of Matthew chapter 5. He will talk this morning about the role of salt and light in our world. Matthew chapter 5. Let's start with verse 13. I have it on the screen if you'd like to follow along if you don't have a Bible. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. Now notice, let's go back. I want to start with just the first word. You, talking to me and you, the followers today, people, it'd be Christians. And so this is very personal to us individually but it can also be applied corporately as the church. He says you, so he's addressing me, he's addressing you, he's addressing the church. And then he says you are. Now notice he doesn't say you're like or you are as or you should be or you can be. He says it with definitive uh, assurance. It's you are. You are. We are. It's, this isn't something that we represent. This isn't something that we provide. This isn't something that we attempt to be. We are. 
We possess this kingdom life. We, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you've already professed Him as your Lord and Savior, you are salt. Our saltiness, the salt that we, we, we have become, it's a byproduct of the fact that we're followers of Jesus. Everybody doesn't exist, everybody on this planet doesn't exist as salt. Only the followers of Jesus. You are. And he says, You are the salt of the earth. Salt of the earth. You ever use that term? I've used that term before. You know, salt of the earth. Salt's important because it impacts whatever it touches. Anything that comes in contact with salt changes to the molecular level. So salt is, a, is an influencer. That's the reason why this morning I've, I've called this a parable of influence. Because we're talking about the influence that Christians, as we are placed in this society, in this culture, in this morally corrupt and spiritually dark place, we can have an impact. We have an influence. When salt is added to something, you know those chemical reactions are invisible. You don't see it necessarily taking place, but the changes are obvious. They're evident. Think about this. What about a timely, encouraging word that you share with someone else? You may never know the impact that has on another person. You may not see that taking place and, and the change that happens in their heart. But it's, take, it's happening. There may be an act of kindness that you perform for another human being. Or maybe there's a time when you take a stand for righteousness on someone else's behalf. You stand up for the little man. Big salt. You're influencing this world. You know, we could imagine ourselves, if you will, as little bitty grains of salt sprinkled by God in our cities and our communities and, and, and in our workplaces and our schools. We're to be salt. We're to impact whatever we touch. And salt also enhances the flavor. Have you ever had like a baked potato with no salt? Uh, or an egg? I eat eggs every morning. I have three eggs every morning. Uh, I, would, I would spit an egg out if it didn't have salt on it. I mean, it's just nasty, isn't it? I mean, anybody like McDonald's french fries? I am down for some McDonald's french fries right now. I'd love to have some. Ben, you go take care of that for me. But you know what? McDonald's french fries without a little bit of salt is like, meh. They're good, but you see, that's what salt does. It enhances the flavor. You see, Christ-like character, our actions, our words, that's our witness. And it brings flavor to this world. It moves it from, meh, to, hey, this is a good deal. You know what? The way we act, the salt that we bring in our communities, in our workplaces, in our schools, as, as we talk to people, our speech, it brings, it brings almost a little sparkle to life. brings a little flavor. You see, that's what Christians do. They, they flavor this world. They make it taste better, if you will. It enriches the, the goodness. As we live... As salt, we actually are making God's work in this world attractive to the non-believers. He says this in Luke chapter 6, verse 35, Love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Completely contrary and on the opposite of the way this world lives. So it's like eating a french fry with no salt, and you're going, yeah, it's kind of what's expected. But when you add a little salt to it, it's like, hey, this is a good deal. This is different. That's what the Christian life does. Go on. It says, then your reward would be great and you will be children of the Most High because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. You see, as we live, that Christ-like flavor comes out of us. We behave in ways that reflect God's nature, it actually accentuates the difference between Christianity and the rest of this world. It, it, it elevates it. it. It makes it attractive. But salt also causes you to be thirsty, doesn't it? 
When those who do not know Christ see us handle life, the sufferings, all the trauma, all the trials, when they see us go through life with calmness, endurance, with hope, they will thirst after what we have. You know, when we begin to share with other people, telling them what we're relying on, who we're relying on, and how sufficient He is, that leads people to want to take a drink of that. You know, Jesus said, I am the living water. You see, the way we, we live our life, it causes others in our communities, people that come in contact with us, they want a drink of that water. They're thirsty for it. Not only that, but salt persevere or preserves. You know, at that time, they didn't have refrigerators. They had no, no way of preserving meat or food. Salt was used to preserve food so it wouldn't spoil. I mean, who in here doesn't love jerky, right? That's what they would do. Meat would be packed in salt and it preserves the food. So Christians, as salt, we're actually, we're actually pres preservative agents ourselves, if you will. I don't really know how else to say that. So when this world is trending towards becoming rotten, at some point we kind of stave that off. We prevent this world from spoiling. Our lifestyles... It, it, our lifestyles model an alternative to the impurities of this world. The Christian lifestyle is, is an alternative to the corrupt morality that this world is trending towards. I like to think of it as almost a firewall or a bulwark. That if, I mean, imagine just for a second, take the Christians out of this world and let it work. What happens? I think I, I think it just I think it just circles the drain, don't it? There's a movie out. It's called City of God. Have you ever heard of it? I haven't watched it myself, but I came across it as I was prepping for this. And apparently, this movie City of God is about a little little barrio outside the city of Rio de Janeiro, where where all cops, legal authority has been removed, so these people are left to fend for themselves. And you know what it actually devolves to? Crime, corruption, murder. It's the Old West. Every man for himself. You see, when you remove the Christian influence, we no longer can keep corruption at bay. But that's what we do. In this corrupt world, we point people to Jesus for salvation. Look at the next one. Let's go on. Verse 14. You are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your Heavenly Father. So just like salt makes a difference in our food, which is really a metaphor for our character, if you will. Here we have light making a difference in our surroundings, which is basically a metaphor for our conduct. You know, in today's industrial age, light is everywhere. Uh, even if, if out here, if you turn off all the lights out here, there's still a glow from the town. You know, there's still this ambient light that, that comes up. We, you and I here in America, even here in rural Barry County, we have no concept of what it means to be truly dark. We have no idea. And that became rather apparent to me whenever I went on mission trip to Africa. We was out in the boonies, out in the bush. And it got dark. And you have no clue what darkness truly is like until you've been in Africa dark. Where you literally have to walk with your hands like this and feel where you're going. Because there's no light anywhere. There's no city four or five miles away that has the lights that are shining in the sky. There's no street lamps. 
There's no homes that are emanating a little bit of light. Nothing. Complete darkness. You know, in, in 2007 while we were there, I began to understand the value of a candle. You know, I remember several years ago when we had a huge ice storm right here. I was just a kid. I think this was back in the 80s. I mean, we lost electricity for like a week in Cassville. Yeah, I don't know if you all remember that, but we did. And I can remember, you know, candles became like money. They're gold. Because in that type of darkness, when it's just, there's no electricity to bring any illumination anywhere, you know, in that kind of darkness, you get a little scared. You know, you feel unbalanced. When, when it's that dark, there's, you're not, never sure of your footing. You're always afraid that you're going to stumble or fall. There, in, in that kind of darkness, you never feel safe. Because you're always... I mean, what lives in darkness? That's danger. There's, there's a chance for no security, no police. I mean, crime lives in the dark. And that's what we was talking about earlier. We live in a metaphorical world of darkness. This is a world that is self-centered. This is a world where the restraints are com continuously being removed. Sin is being normalized and elevated. There's always an increase in violent crime. There's more shootings every day in Chicago than there is for a year here in Southwest Missouri. I mean, this, this culture is continuously pushing the boundaries of morality. It's a dark place. That's why being a light of the world is so important. Because a light is meant to be seen. Verse 15, look at it again. This sounds like elementary stuff to us, but think of it in context here. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. You don't put buckets over candles. That's silliness. Why light it in the first place? You don't turn on a lamp and then cover it with a blanket. The light is lit for a purpose. Your light exists for a purpose. You know, light dispels darkness. That's what it does. Darkness is actually the, the absence of light. I want you to think about this. Light can overcome darkness. Darkness can never extinguish light. Light has power. Even in the darkest places. If I mean, in Africa, if somebody had turned on a flashlight, everybody would have noticed it. Have you ever noticed how bugs kind of gravitate towards light? You see that light, you know why? It says hope. There's hope. It's not all dark. There's hope. And in the light, it pierces the darkness. It provides clarity. The darkness actually kind of creates a little bit of distortion, doesn't it? But when Christians shine their light through their good deeds, we provide a clear representation of who God truly is and the possibilities of a life lived in Christ. We can provide security. That's like a lighthouse on the shore. Shining its light, warning the ships of an in incoming coastline. When that, if, if we was to lose all electricity this morning, all of these little emergency lights would come on. Whenever you see an ambulance driving down the road and the lights going, it provides a little bit of security. That help is on the way. Light lights our path. It provides assurance in the footing. But I need you to know that the light that we shine is not our own. The sh the, any light that comes from me is not produced because I'm a good dude, right? The light that is produced, that is emanated from our lives is the light that is given and provided by Christ, by, the, by what He has done in our lives. 
We are merely a reflection of His light. Ben read it earlier. I want to read it again. I am the light of the world. John 8.12 If you follow Me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. That's His light, not mine. And it provides life. 2 Corinthians 3, 16 and 18. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil, you know, the veil, a veil is something that covers our eyes, says whenever we turn to the Lord, that veil is taken away. And so all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is a spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. Notice that when we come to Christ, whatever is covering us, whatever has, has disguised us, if you will, it's removed. And Christ in us is reflected to the nations. Philippians 2.15 says, Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. We are designed purposely to shine for Jesus. We have a purpose. We have, there is a specific reason Christ comes in and changes us. But I want to ask you a question. How do you think God feels about people who verbally confess Christ, but then don't live their lives to reflect that light? How do you think He feels about that? You know, people who suppress the light or live in denial with a lifestyle that's contrary to these good deeds. If you're not shining, do you really possess the light? That's what I would ask. And I know that's a lot of that's symbolic, but it just kind of boils down to this. If you're truly saved, you're going to shine bright. The things that you do, the way that you act, the, 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 the things that you think are going to reflect this world, to this world. If you're not shining, if you're not pointing people to Jesus, my contention is you probably don't have Jesus. I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. But when we live good, our lives by good deeds, not necessarily by words, I'm talking doing good things, our, our God... He takes those deeds and, and He uses them to reflect the love of God to the other people. We shine. And so we shine so radically different from the rest of the world, this morally corrupt, spiritually dark world, we bring light to dark places. And because of all these things, there's a couple of warnings that I'll end with. Number one, don't lose your flavor. If you've got your little your little cheat sheet there on the back. I think that's number three. Don't lose your flavor. The purpose of salt is to be salty. If it isn't salty, it can't preserve. If it isn't salty, it can't season. That salt then is worthless. It has no value. But when it's pure salt, pure salt never loses its flavor. But if you take pure salt and then mix it with an impurity like sand, it no longer is salty. It loses that flavor. It loses its ability to preserve. So if you allow impurities into your life, you'll begin to lose your saltiness. 1 Corinthians 15.33, it says, bad company corrupts good character. Do you want to bring some impurities if you want to lose your saltiness a little bit? Start hanging out with people you know you shouldn't be hanging out with. Keep yourselves from sin. Maintain your purity. The second thing in all of this that I just want to remind you, you know, salt, if I have a salt shaker and I set it down, that salt is only going to be good if I pour it out. You know, salt doesn't, doesn't enhance the flavor or preserve anything unless it actually leaves the salt shaker. You know, when, when we come together here as the church, 
the impact of our saltiness stays right here. That saltiness only impacts this world when we leave here. When we go and interact with the rest of the world. When we move out of here and into the world, we could share Christ's transforming power. We can flavor things. We can preserve things. Get out of your salt shaker, if you will. Number four on your sheet. Don't hide your light. He says this in very simple terms. He says, a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. I'm sure everybody in here can imagine that. A city on top of a hill with lots of electricity. I mean, it's going to shine bright. You're going to see it from miles away. But the sad thing is, we often hide our light. We, we, we put that basket over ourselves when we are quiet about things that we should speak up about. We hide our light when we just simply go along with the crowd. We hide our light when we deny the source of our light. You know, we hide our light when we choose self over other people. That's hiding the light. The travesty, the worst thing would be if we would take credit for the light. You know, simply living a life of integrity in this light, or as a light in this dark world. Don't refuse to be lazy on the job. Ignore the temptation to steal. Ignore the temptation to be greedy. Be generous with what you have. Be the first to help someone else out. It's, I, you know, I, I take spiritual concepts and often use them in math formulas. So in my mind, it's others are greater than self. That's what it means to let your light shine. Live in such a way that there is no question what the source of your light is. You know, the, the light that lives within us is part of the kingdom. And it can be transformational to someone's life if you allow it. Well, let me finish with just one final question. And I, I want, I've written it down, this question I wanted to ask. How does Jesus' parable about salt and light apply to us today? So as we read that, the question I want to ask is, all right, what does this mean to me today? I think it says two things. I think it says that these two things are highly valued. At the time that Jesus is saying this, salt was a valuable commodity. In, in fact, soldiers were paid in salt. Roman soldiers would sometimes receive their month's wages in salt. That's where we actually get the word salary. It, com it comes from that. Salt. And so I think when Jesus is saying, you are the salt of the world and you are the light of the world, He's saying you have value. You know, at a time when electricity doesn't exist, a candle is a valuable thing. A flame is a valuable thing. Light becomes a very desirable element. I mean, without light during Jesus' time, when the sun goes down until the sun comes up, nobody does nothing. Everybody's on a lockdown. But allow them to have this little element of light. It then allows for much more opportunities. And so it is a very desirable, very valuable element. And salt the same way. And so I just want to encourage you. You have value. You are the crown of creation. You have been bought with a price. Every single one of us. Our testimony, our personal ministry, those things are essential to the order of this world. Without Christians, this world just simply spirals into chaos. We're light and we're salt. But I also want to provide one more warning. Because you can d diminish the value of our testimony by allowing impurities. 
and by doing deeds that hide our light. You know, the value of salt is directly tied to its purity. And so, pure 100% NaCl, that's worth a lot. But you mix it with a little sand, mix it with a little dirt, it, the value of that salt immediately goes down. And it loses its ability to preserve and season this world. But, hmm, keep in mind, too much salt ruins things, right? You can't overdo it. Don't overdo it. A little bit of salt. You know, yeah, I can shine too much light and blind someone. I can pour too much salt into the food and it ruins the recipe. Courtesy and kindness are always appropriate in this context. And don't hold back as you live your lives as light and salt. Take the risk. Even if you have to stand alone, take the risk. I mean, people are going to think you're weird. But I guarantee you, later in time, when everything is behind you, people will say, I appreciate that. I'm glad you did that. I'm glad you took that stand. So don't worry about just a few critics. You know, they may try to silence you or argue with you or force you to back off. Shrug it off with a smile. Remember, you have been placed here to be salt and light. To stave off the moral corruption and the spiritual darkness. And your light is not your own. It has been given to you for a purpose. Let it shine. Let's pray. Lord, it's become apparently obvious to me God, that there is, that you have, along with the joy of salvation, there comes a a strong responsibility that we have to live it out. We have to live as salt. We have to live as light. And if I don't, if I don't stay focused, if those things aren't a priority, Lord, I, it's, I, I can, I can absolutely make a mess of those things. And so, Father, I pray not only for myself, but I pray for us as as a community of believers that as we leave here, that we would shine like like that pinpoint of light in, in the darkest of dark places. Lord, knowing that it's attractive to people and that the our character, the way we live, brings brings flavor to this world. And it distinguishes us from how the rest of the world lives. And so, Father God, I just pray that You would be our strength, our rock. You would be our source of energy. You would be our main love, our main priority. And that when we find those, those places difficult to overcome, and, and Lord, we don't, we don't necessarily feel like being salt or light. Lord, I pray that Your Spirit would empower us to accomplish great things for your glory. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.